way in the back. All right, this, this gentleman here in the gray sweater, here. So I'm wondering if you could speak to this intersection between what you talked about initially, which was the, the problem of the, the, or the separation between the educated and the, and the less well-educated, and then the problem that, that Mark raised, which is the problem, although he didn't raise it in this language, the problem of race, which, you know, those two things, as I understand it, pretty much explain the success of Trump. And, uh, and I think that also explains why Trump came from the Republican Party, because ever since Nixon, they've been targeting, uh, you know, they've, they've, been, they've used the Southern strategy to go after that exact demographic. Um, so, is this now a moment where, is this a, a Pete Wilson in California moment where they've basically blown it, they've basically, you know, tarred themselves as a racist party and they're, and they're going to go into decline as a result? Or is this something that you can perceive a different, a different outcome for where actually racism is elevated within the society in the United States and elsewhere in the world? And who are you directing that to? Uh, well, I guess yeah. maybe Nick, uh, but then I'd be interested in other. Yeah, I think uh, I think you know one of the issues is what I talked about the whole idea of uh, giving license and copycats, right? Uh, to things that are not great for what I'll say the uh, social fabric. I'm also a big believer in uh, in uh, I guess it's kind of like the market, the technical correction. So the parties veer in one direction and then they correct themselves. So I, th I think I would say that the, the Republican Party, and I would say that uh, Trump just happens to be a Republican, or have a Republican thing on his, but he's not really a Agreed. Yeah, right? So, so You're not he, happens to be the, he happens to be someone that has won on a Republican ticket. How about that? Um, but they've been targeting, the yeah. Republican Party has been, you know, wooing white voters with racist rhetoric since Nixon, or since Reagan, certainly, and, it, and the strategy goes back to Nixon. Yeah, well, it, this speaks to kind of, uh, I, I think one of the broader problems is, uh, and I'm sure the, both the Democrat, uh, both Mike and Jeff can chime in on this, has to do with the polarizations within the parties themselves, that there's been a market increase in the proportion of independent voters, which has made both of the parties extremes, right? Because the people that are left are like in are the people that have more extreme attitudes because the moderate Republicans and I would say some moderate Democrats or more centrist Democrats are now independents. So the parties are now distortions of what they were uh, in the past, right? And uh, and I think and uh, you know I would say so you know we could have another uh, Mark could probably do a whole lecture on partisanship and the decline of partisanship, but you know you look at Canada and that. Uh, you know, when you look at the people who are left as members of the Conservative Party of Canada, uh, and it's not the same party that it was, I would say, 20 years ago. Uh, I don't disagree with you that the Republican Party and, and some of, well, some of the candidates within the Republican Party have espoused what I find very racist and distasteful uh, rhetoric. Um, there are also a lot of Republicans who are not racist and, and, and don't agree with that. I'm sitting next to one of them. Um, but let's also remember that we just came off of eight years of the first African-American president of the United States. So the United States has come a long way relative to race. Uh, the, the challenge is that we... <laughs> The, the coalition that came out for Obama didn't turn out for Hillary Clinton, and those are Democratic-leaning voters that didn't show up. I mean, Michael Moore had this right when he, he sent out you know, his email the, the week before the election, and he said, what's really going to cost this election are the Bernie Sanders voters who turn out, but they don't bring five more voters with them or their kids, their millennials, stay home or go for the Green Party candidate. And that's why I said earlier, 
You know, I don't think the Democratic Party's future is about winning over angry white men. As Michael Moore also said in his email, they're breathing their last gasps. <laughs> you know, and this might have been it, this election. Maybe they've got one more in them. I don't know. I mean, I think the future of the party, uh, and I was wrong on this. I, I, I said, you know, oh, Bernie Sanders, you know, we're, we, we, it's not going to work. So he built all this momentum. He was getting huge traction on fundraising with small dollar donors. He was doing so well. Look at the states where Bernie Sanders did, did really well. They were states that had open primaries where he could compete for not just the Democrats, but independent voters that wanted to vote in the Democratic primary. He was on to something. He tapped into a very similar vein of discontent that, that, that Trump did, uh, but the party missed the mark. Um, and and I, you know, one of the things that we talked about in the past is the, the parties and how they pick their nominees play big time into why we are in the situation we're in right now. The Democrats have this approach where we give a lot of power to party VIPs, members of Congress, governors, former presidents. They get a lot of sway, super delegates. And so that's how you get a, a person like Clinton, who's got a lot of chips to be called in, who, who d does real well in the Democratic process. The Republicans don't have that super delegate system. They're much more open, and they had a free-for-all of all these candidates, and, 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 and that's why Trump was able to sort of come up and, and do as well as he did. Think about if the Republicans had had the Democratic rules for selecting nominees, and the Democrats had the Republican rules. You would not have had Trump as the nominee of the Republican Party, and I think you probably would have had Bernie Sanders as the nominee of the Democratic Party, because the grassroots of the party really was getting behind Sanders. But that's all in the rearview mirror, didn't happen, and what the hell. <laughs> <laughs> but it's fun to think about. I just like this uh, if I just say something about Republicans and racism, I, I, I don't accept... It's a strategy, not the individuals. They, they won the South. It's, it's... Okay, that's helpful. It's a strategy, <laughs> not the individuals. <laughs> you're, 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 you're right. You're, you're not, no, you're, it's a historical fact. You're correct that Nixon adopted a Southern strategy in 1968. Um, the Republican Party, historically, was the party that... that that gave the slaves their freedom. They got the majority of their vote for decades and decades and decades. Now, okay, I, okay, let's do, but let, let me just say this. I do not believe that, that, that very many Republicans are racist. I don't see that, I, but I do see the Democrats constantly trying to play that card and claiming that Republicans are racist or sexist or xenophobic or whatever it may be. And that goes to Mike's view that the demographics are lining up for the, for the Democrats. And it is if you can take all of these groups and say the bad guys are the Republicans. Sorry, Laura, That's you want okay. to move on? That's okay. I just want to make sure we get some other yeah. questions in here. So get your hands up again. And okay, this gentleman here. And keep, try to keep your questions short so we can get as many of them in as we can. Um, on, on election day, the vast majority of municipal well, city halls in the United States went Democrat. They remain Democrat. We're an urban nation in Canada. Um, we have progressive city halls, London, England, Paris, Rio de Janeiro, so forth. Is this where we'll see new anger, sanctuary cities, I can respond to that on the U.S. side because there have been uh, a number of studies that were published and models that were published and they uh, before the election um, that actually predicted um, a, a, a Trump win. Even the keepers of the models didn't believe their own models and said they, they can't be right this time. Sure. But there were two factors. One I alluded to at the, at the opening and that is 6.9% um, want to see change. So there's that big swing. But the other, and it goes back to 1992 I believe, there's been an increase in the Republican vote in rural America, small town America, and small cities. And, and the Democrats have been increasing their vote in large metropolitan areas, but that's about it. And what you've got is a very heavily populated um, uh, sections of the United States that are comparatively rural. But it can include Mike's Akron, Ohio, which would be a Republican um, 
small city, and 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 it, it, it's funny how it's funny how it's swaying. But it, it but the, you you see you see the Republicans capturing more and more and more counties. If you break it down by county or precinct level, they're very very red. With to your point, the Democrats increasing their vote, but not as much in the large cities. Professor, you might have a comment on. Well, I mean, this is actually the kind of these questions relate. Let me just. This is what I do in class, right? Uh, good, good point, good point. I mean, now I'm uh, so, yeah, that's how that works. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the things that, that's been shown as happening in the US is that their identities are aligning in the ways they haven't before, which is to say, more and more, one's partisan identity, being a Republican, being a Democrat, is more and more aligning with whether you feel that you are, uh, you identify as being black or identify as being white. You can be white without actually identifying. But anyways, so and you can also people identify as being feminist is actually also aligning with your partisanship. Uh, being identifying as someone who's from a rural area versus identifying as being someone who's from a cosmopolitan city are also aligning with your partisanship. And so all these things are aligning, and that is one of the reasons that things are becoming so polarized and hard for people to talk across the lines because. If we have, if you're a cross-pressured individual, which is to say, I, you know, you and I, we agree on some things, but we differ on other things. We have some common basis on which to talk about. But the more and more the two parties they they they, they polarize. So everyone in the Republican Party is a, is you know is, is white, uh, is older, uh, is from the rural area, and everyone in the Democratic Party you know is, identifies as a feminist, uh, is is not white or or doesn't necessarily strongly identifies being white and so on, there's no commonality to talk across. And that's really a problem. Now, that, the, reason, the way that'll change is gonna be through a new leader that comes in and says, okay, I know I'm a Republican, but that doesn't mean I can't be a feminist, right? Um, or, or someone, again, I think someone who come along, they can mobilize millennials who aren't necessarily thinking, you know, most millennials don't have a problem with the idea of being a feminist, right, man or woman. So when, you get the, when millennials start voting, I don't know if anyone's here who's a millennial, go out and vote. Um, <laughs> I think, sorry? We all vote, yes, thank you. Yeah, the, the problem is the ones who vote are here. The ones who don't vote are not here. But so when, when, they, when they vote, I do think there's going to be a shift. It, particularly it's when it's a leader who can come and take, it could be a Republican or the Democratic Party, either one, who a leader from either party gets the nomination and mobilizes that group. Then I think we're beginning to see a shift in that polarization. But, but that's, that's, that's a prediction. I have no idea if it's true. We have time for just a few more questions. Um, and I would love to get a woman asking a question. There you go. Yeah. Um, we got to wait for your mic. <coughs> Laura, you referred to micro-targeting, and we saw a lot of that with Obama. And um, I want to get a sense from you of how that has evolved. It feels like it is getting far more tailored uh, we're starting to see feeds in our Facebook or, or Twitter feeds that, that are specifically targeted. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about big data, a little bit about how micro-targeting has evolved and what role it may have played here in the United States election and in Brexit. Sure. Uh, how many here have a Gmail account? So Google scrapes, I'll call it scrape, they scrape your emails, everyone's emails. And then you get a targeted advertisement based on whatever you type in your emails. So say for example, if you type that you're having marital problems with your wife in a private email to your brother or your sister, you'll find out in a couple weeks that you'll get an ad for divorce lawyers show up. <laughs> you know, there's a, it was, I just read about it the other day, there's a firm in Victoria that helped do the micro-targeting for the Brexit campaign. And that's all they did was run algorithms for the placement of Facebook ads to have targeted messages to people that they felt fit a particular profile so that it would be part of their echo chamber that you were talking about, right? So, so you know, I guess, so, you know, this is, uh, so the, the micro-targeting, you know, in, in the old days, you were talking about groups. Well, now it's bespoke messaging and micro-targeting to the individual where they, uh, you know, were you can estimate what the likelihood is. Like I know for one of my colleagues, um, well, I have a colleague in Germany who does the polling for ARD, the big uh, public, the public broadcaster. I'm, a, I'm business partners with him. He has, you know, he calculated on a block by block basis. This is, you'd love this. He calculated on a block by block basis the probability of people voting in a particular way, the mathematical probability. And uh, so. 
big data is kind of enabling. So the good news is, is that this is kind of like anything. If it was, if it was for good, you could use this to engage in people, right, and inform people. Uh, but uh, it's a, uh, it's a very powerful. Uh, I worry about it as a guy that's in the big data business. I worry about how it can be used, uh, because uh, especially with the blurriness between what is fact and what is not fact, what is opinion and what is news, right? What is real and what is not real. Um, so it's uh, so it's it's another you know this goes back to everything is getting quite complex and but a lot of times these don't lead to kind of necessarily better outcomes it leads they lead to greater risks at least in, in my opinion so I couldn't mention just a dark side that's might be happening for some of this market targeting is that the ideal person to target is someone who is likely to vote because they're not likely to vote why target them and who's likely to change their opinions the problem is with that is you're not targeting people who are unlikely to vote. Now, in the old days, when you couldn't micro-target and you would just say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna canvas this entire neighborhood because I know it's relatively Republican, so I'm just gonna canvas the whole thing. You capture people who are likely to vote, you got to capture people who are not very likely to vote. And you might mobilize some of those people who are not likely to vote. Now, those people are not being mobilized at all. So in other words, if you are not likely to vote, you'll probably not be targeted to be mobilized to get out and vote. So you're actually showing that this is actually having an effect on who's voting in the US. That you can actually show from election to election, the more they target, those people who had a low probability of turning out have even a lower probability the next election, and even lower probability the next election. Because they're ignored. They're ignored. They're basically yeah. ignored. Yeah, I just wanted to add to that. You know, I think people were losing their minds when this thing called the television came around, and they'd been used to listening to the radio for, for years and years and years. You know, there's always going to be some new technology or new manipulation of technology. Yeah, I've been involved with enough campaign final days of the election in Washington, Pennsylvania, and Michigan. She was believing, no offense, Nick, she was believing the polls. She was believing her own rhetoric. And that was all saying, you're going to, you haven't, we, Democrats have won Wisconsin since 1992. Democrats have won Michigan since 1992. We've won Pennsylvania since then. There's no way you're going to, she believed it. Who was saying, don't believe it? Bill Clinton was saying, don't believe it. You've got to get to those states. You need to talk to those people. She had more campaign people in, in Iowa, and the folks in, in Michigan were begging for door knockers to come to Michigan. They were begging in Pennsylvania rural areas for the urban door knockers to come out and, and start knocking on doors and engage with voters. The most effective way to win elections, I believe, in my opinion, is you got to connect with voters. you got to have a compelling message, and you've got to have people out there singing your praises, and, and that's what Obama did so well. He used the technology, but he had a ton of people out there knocking on doors, phoning, knocking on the same door again, phoning again. He was very good at that. And but, we, but, we missed that in, in, in a few of these key states. But, but Trump had $400 million less than yes, Clinton. Yeah. And I would say, and I don't think there were lots of, there were lots of as many enthusiastic Republicans, right? Uh, who is a Republican? <laughs> no, but my point is, is that if you're angry, if you have voters that are angry, you don't need a machine. You don't need to call them to remind them to vote, right? They get, they vote with their feet. In the same way, like Mark was talking about change elections. When there are change elections, the winners don't necessarily need massive organizations to maximize and optimize the vote because it's a change election and people are ready for change. And they're going to get in their car, they're going to walk down the street, and they're going to get out and vote. So, uh, you know, I think that's, so, you know, I agree with your first two statements about the you know, message inspiring, message and connecting. But, uh, you know, I think in this, in this world where some voters are angry, and if, they're, if they feel that they are unemployed, they lost their job, and someone kind of whips them up into whatever, that they go, go out. And, you know, the polls were right, right? Because I the because, aggregate, yeah, right. the aggregate polls were correct. Because I never believed the assumption that uh, that some people commentators had that uh, Trump supporters would not articulate their support to pollsters. Yeah. I don't think Trump any anyone that was voting for Donald Trump was embarrassed that they were voting for him, mm -hmm. right? Which is why the national polls, at least, were, uh, were right. quite accurate. Yeah. Okay, I think we'll leave it there, and we actually just sort of came back around in the beginning with that last answer. Wasn't that great? Um, I just want to welcome Ali Saladin, the director and former president of the SFU Alumni Association Board of Directors, to the stage. <laughs> Hello, 
everyone. On behalf of SFU, Public Square, the SFU Alumni Association, I would like to thank our speakers tonight, Nick Nanos, Mark Pickup, Mike Veneer, Jeff Peterson, and of course our moderator, Laura Lynch, for leading us through such a... <laughs> Trump did that. That was Trump. Yeah. <laughs> I know. That's right. Acknowledging, I think we covered that earlier today as well. <laughs> so, what I wanted to say is just uh, thank you for leading us through such a rich and diverse dialogue on areas of shifting attitudes, people driven movements, the role of the media, and of course the important role that Canada can play in the world today. And through tonight's mutual exchange of ideas, we've all been able to really broaden our perspectives. And by seeing this diversity of viewpoints as a strength, we hopefully can enable ourselves to become more active, engaged members of civil society. And it really is this ethic of seeing diversity as a strength, of valuing human diversity through pluralism, that is one of Canada's greatest strengths as a middle power that we can share with the world but pluralist societies are simply not automatically created and we cannot take them for granted. As we discussed earlier today, we are not immune either. And pluralist societies really are developed through a series of deliberate choices that we as society make. They're a product of an enlightened education system, active involvement from civil society, and investment for all levels of government. And so pluralism is a continuous process that must be nurtured and it's really through institutions such as SFU, public forums such as this, and the participation of all of you here tonight that plays an important role in this continuous process. So thank you to you, the audience, our alumni, our friends of SFU, uh, for really being part of this important process. Thank you again to our panelists, and of course to all the volunteers and staff of SFU Public Square and its partners. Thank you and have a good evening.